Uh, good evening to everyone uh, joining us from the United Kingdom and uh, good afternoon for those of you uh, based in the United States. Uh, my name is Patrick Roth. I am uh, Vice President of the Cambridge Middle East and North Africa Forum. For those of you joining us uh, at an event for the first time, uh, MANAF is a society of the University of Cambridge and a think tank startup focusing on the current affairs uh, of the Middle East and uh, North Africa region. And of course, discussing uh, current affairs, Iraq has captivated um, the attention of analysts uh, this past year uh, and is becoming increasingly important in uh, regional geopolitics as we uh, start facing numerous uh, um, issues uh, ranking higher and higher on the foreign policy agenda of decision makers, uh, including Iran, uh, the crisis in Lebanon. Uh, but since last October's elections, Iraq has been in relative political turmoil, spending total political paralysis, mass resignation, the occupation of the parliament more recently um, by protesters, followed by and a spate of nationwide uh, violence last month. And while calm has momentarily returned to Baghdad um, and a new president was elected on 13th of October, and since then, since we published the event um, and our conversation today, a prime minister was also chosen. But uh, the question that people are asking right now, just how stable will the situation be and, and where can this possibly lead in terms of uh, concrete uh, uh, policymaking processes? Uh, so our panel today will address some of these most pressing questions about domestic politics in Iraq and also what is happening in the region. Um, uh, what implications Iraqi politics has on regional geopolitics and we will also touch a little bit, little bit up about on the flip side on what regional geopolitics uh, um, and what issues will filter into uh, Iraqi decision making. Uh, we are very lucky to have with us today uh, Rasha Alakidi and Dr. Uh, Michael Knights. Uh, Russia is a uh, Middle East deputy editor at New Lines magazine. She is an Iraqi researcher and an analyst based out of Washington, D.C. Uh, Russia's work focuses on non-state armed groups, political Islam, um, and she has been focusing greatly on her uh, native Mosul in Iraq. Uh, prior to joining uh, New Lines magazine, uh, Russia worked in political and security research analysis at uh, various think tanks, including George Washington University's uh, program on extremism, foreign policy, the Foreign Policy Research Institute, and also uh, a Dubai-based uh, uh, MS Bar Studies and Research Center. Uh, she is a frequent commentator in Iraq, um, and we really look forward to having your take um, on events today, Russia. And of course, Dr. Michael Knights uh, is Jill and Jay Bursty Fellow at the Washington Institute, also in uh, DC, specializing in the military and security affairs of Iraq, Iran, as well as uh, the Gulf states. Uh, Michael is the co-founder of the Militia Spotlight platform, which is a platform that uh, my colleagues and I frequently utilize uh, here at the forum. It's very informative and I highly encourage you to check it out. Uh, it offers in-depth analysis of developments related to the Iranian-backed militias operating uh, in Iraq, obviously, and also in Syria. Uh, Dr. Knights uh, has traveled widely across the region to Iraq, Yemen, and the Gulf states, and uh, regularly briefs US government policymakers congressional committees, uh, as well as uh, military officers on uh, security affairs. Uh, you might notice that uh, Dr. Uh, Abbas Kadim is unfortunately not with us this evening. Uh, he had a last minute family emergency that he is uh, uh, at present attending to, and he is sending his apologies that he is unable to join for the event today. But as Rasha and uh, Michael um, and I discussed over the preparatory minutes uh, before this uh, meeting, we will try to make up for uh, Dr. Abbas's uh, part. Even if he cannot be replaced, we will try to do our best to cover some of the topics that uh, uh, he was hoping to introduce to you. Uh, so thank you very much, uh, Rasha and Michael. It's a pleasure to have you this evening. As always, we will open uh, the event with uh, introductory remarks from our speakers and uh, move to a moderated discussion. Uh, the final part of this talk will also give an opportunity to our attendees to ask their own questions. So feel free to make use of the Q&A function of Zoom. You will find uh, the Q&A box uh, in the middle of your uh, uh, menu options uh, at the bottom of your screen. Uh, feel free to send us questions already during the discussion, uh, and I will make sure to remind you as we get closer to the, uh, the Q&A. Uh, so we will start with uh, uh, your introductory remarks, if that's okay with you. I'm not sure who would like to go first, but uh, Russia, Michael, uh, the floor is yours.
Michael, would you like to start first? Ooh, I'm old fashioned. I would say ladies first. Do you want me to go first, Russia? Yes, yes, absolutely. <clears throat> okay. Um, okay, so um, it's great to be here. Um, I like the way the session was introduced, very crisp. Um, it's a shame we don't have a bass here today because it would give it a little more back and forth, probably. Um, <clears throat> but, you know, even a bass, I think, is probably got some serious question marks about the government that just formed in Iraq. Um, and that's saying something, you know, because with previous governments in Iraq, you know, he, he has defended them when others were criticizing them heavily. Um, now, look, we're at the start of uh, a new government in Iraq, which could last a year or two years if it goes for early elections, as it has somewhat hinted it might. Um, I don't believe that. I think they'll go all the way through to 2025 uh, and then hold in, you know, the, the elections are in 2025 in theory at the latest October. And then you end up with another six months plus of government formation after that. I suspect these guys are going to try and settle in and bed down and change the composition of the Iraqi government as much as they can within the time they have at their disposal. Um, you know, some people will say, let's give this government a chance. Let's um, let's not presume anything about it from the beginning. You know, it's led by um, Mohammad Shia al-Sadani, who is a former governor, a former minister, an agricultural engineer. Decent guy, you know, from what I can tell from the interactions I've had with him. Not somebody that I am horrified to see as the prime minister of Iraq. But what I am horrified is the way he comes to the seat. And that matters in Iraq more than anything else, even more than the, the personality of the individual who takes over as the chief executive. It's how you come and who put you on the throne. That's what matters. And in Iraq, I think it's very justifiable for us to say uh, this government has a lot to prove as it kicks off. Um, so much so that, you know, it, it leaves a caveat there that it may dissolve itself within a year or two years and go to new elections because, you know, it wants breathing space from an electorate, from an international community that is actually deeply sceptical of this government. Why is that? Ultimately, it, this is going to get forgotten very quickly, but this government is uh, the result of a failed democratic process. Uh, elections were OK. UN certified them, results got certified, basically okay from that perspective. But then the peaceful transfer of power that followed did not work correctly. Now, it's true that the majority bloc um, who could have formed the government in the immediate aftermath of the elections made many mistakes, hesitated, lost initiative, lost momentum, and there's no doubt they are significantly partially to blame. Uh, for their pettiness, for their ineffectiveness. Uh, but it should also be remembered that from the very moment these elections finished, the coordination framework actors, who are currently the heart of the new government, uh, the, an, an element that has strong Iranian influence uh, on that bloc, uh, you know, from the start, they threatened street violence when they didn't like the results. Then they tried to kill the prime minister of Iraq with a drone attack when they didn't like the results. And then they used corrupt judiciary under Faik Zaydan uh, to change the rules of how you form government. In other words, they moved the goalposts. They saw the ball was about to cross the goal line. So they just moved that goalpost a little bit so it missed instead. And as a result, they ultimately played on the winner's lack of patience and they frustrated the winners to the extent where the major bloc, Mokhtar al-Sadr's bloc, simply gave up and left the political process. So the largest winning bloc in Iraq left the process because there was no way the winners could turn their result into a government formation. That's a lot to live up to. That's a lot to overcome in a new government. They should hold early elections, and they probably won't. But anyway, we're starting from the point of view of legitimacy deficit, huge legitimacy deficit. Second, um, 
This government is led by the coordination of framework leaders that undermined the democratic process in Iraq and ultimately ended up winning by cheating. Uh, what do we see them doing the moment they get into government? It's a throwback to the 2018-2019 government of Adelaide Del Mardi, but it's a little more shameless even. Uh, they come straight in, they put in place as the Prime Minister's spokesman, uh, Rabia Nada, a figure who was involved in setting up Al-Ettaja TV, a television channel of the US-designated terrorist movement, Qatar Bizbullah, and al Ahad TV, the television channel of US-designated terrorist movement, Asab al -Hak. This is no technocrat, this is no media uh, uh, technician. This is somebody who was vetted to the highest levels to create the disinformation channels that serve the Iran-backed militia elements in Iraq. And now he's the prime minister of Iraq's spokesman. We have four sanctioned individuals who have ministers in this government. Kais Kazali, sanctioned for terrorism. Farah Fayyad and Ryan Kildani, sanctioned for serious human rights abuses against the Iraqi people. Hamas Kanjar, sanctioned for the corruption of the Iraqi political process. We have one of the key militia leaders holding a ministry, uh, Qatar Jundal Imams Ahmed al-Assadi. We have key ministries like higher education, the students, the universities, under an Asab al haq terrorist. We have uh, Ministry of Trade, Ministry of Communications, with all sorts of sensitive technologies under their control, including the internet, under the sanctioned individuals. We have a new Prime Minister's military advisor immediately brought in, who was so toxic to the Western intelligence agencies, Saad al alaq that they tried to have as little contact with him as possible and to share as little intelligence with him as possible. So, you know, right now we have a government that has at its heart the protest killers of 2019. And one of the key deliverables we need to see from these guys is that they do not start mass repression again all over. Third and finally, you know, I created a scoreboard for how this new government should be rated. And one of the most important things is that they should not purge out the technocrats who are able to maintain normal relations with the rest of the world. So here we have, for instance, the head of Iraqi National Intelligence Service. Well, they did just remove the head of that service. We don't know who they're going to put in. But if it is not an individual that the US and the Western intelligence agencies can trust, because we have folders inches thick on these guys, then what are we going to do? That's going to be the end of the intelligence sharing relationship with one of the key counterterrorism partners in the world. What about the military? Can we trust that our partner military is going to be led by people who will protect their foreign guests instead of firing rockets at them? We've already seen the removal of two key individuals uh, from the senior chain of command, including the International Zone Security Force Commander uh, and the Deputy Chief of Staff for Operations, the most important day-to-day -day interface with the Western um, uh, uh, militaries. Oil exports, ports, airports, and the Central Bank of Iraq and its dollar auctions are all immediately being assaulted. We need to see this government release the growing numbers of US Iraqi joint citizens who are being detained in Iraq at the moment because they have in the past been critical towards militias or the corrupt judiciary under Vaik Zaydan. We need to see the ceasefire of all attacks against neighboring states. And right now there's a high level security threat against Saudi Arabia, most likely coming out of Iraq in the coming weeks. We need to see that the Kurdistan region of Iraq is not bombarded by the militias who now make up the Iraqi government from inside Iraq. And we need to see credible anti-corruption uh, undertaken. We just heard that $2.5 billion disappeared from uh, the Iraqi treasury. Let's make sure that that's not just a witch hunt that is misdirected on individuals who had very little to do with this, while concealing the involvement of the parties that actually make up the core coordination framework block. If that investigation goes nowhere, 
or ends up just uh, shooting a couple of junior messengers, then that will be a very clear indicator where the Sudanic government is going, that it is following on precisely in the footsteps of the Adelaide al Mahdi government, but faster and worse, that it is accepting attacks on US forces, attempts to withdraw, to remove coalition forces from Iraq, hostage taking of US Iraqi joint citizens, robbing and asset stripping of the Iraqi state. You know, these things are gonna be very visible to us. And after the Adelaide Mahdi period, we're still very dialed in to watching the indicators of this stuff happening. And there will be changes probably in the US uh, Congress and possibly even in the presidency uh, within the coming years. And Iraq needs to tread very carefully uh, when it comes to its relations with the West, because much of the hope that was invested in the Academy era of government, uh, and you know, there were mistakes and lack of energy on the Academy side uh, of the equation as well. Uh, much of that hope is completely gone now. And in the Iraqi people, the hope that an election could change things is lower than it's ever been before. And in the international community, trust in the Iraqi government is lower than it's ever been before. So this is a government that has a lot to prove. And I welcome them proving it. Uh, but I'm not going to start with a blank sheet because they've already done some things. And the way they came was ultimately anti-democratic and uh, speaks of a very deep lack of legitimacy. Over. Thank you very much, Michael. Russia, the floor is yours. Thank you so much uh, for the invitation. It is great to be here. And thanks, Michael, for the uh, for that brilliant introduction. Um, I, I, I wholeheartedly um, agree. And we have to also kind of look at it from the current winner's perspective and what they what they played on and what they uh, what they managed to maneuver and manipulate very well. Two things also, um, in addition to the domestic uh, the domestic component of it, which, as Michael said, was the impatience and perhaps sort of brutish uh, nature of the original or the, the authentic winner, which were the Southern movements. Um, they have not really been a political movement in the sense that we understand it um, in, in contemporary politics. There's always been a confusion about the Southern and whether they are a more religious uh, component of Iraqi society, Muqtada himself never really being a politician, but the leader of a movement. And that was something that uh, he did not know, and neither his followers really understood how to manage. Whereas the coordination framework, if we're talking about the popular mobilization forces who very much copied um, the IRGC, who are a military institution, as well as politicians, they copied that model almost identically. They they were successful in implementing it into, into Iraq. And at a time that uh, where they exploited the international, also international confusion to some extent during the campaign against ISIS. So the, the bar was very, very low because it was either ISIS or which definitely were the, were the worst. And that allowed them a lot of space to maneuver as they as they wished. And this is where Muqtada kind of failed. The other thing is that the, the sort of disinterest, or at least from their perspective or from the Iraqi perspective, when you go to Iraq, you see that there's some disengagement from Iraq, where it's no longer really a priority for Western uh, for Western nations, whether it's its allies, um, whether it's when it comes to security, when it comes to the democratic process itself, um, the interest in Iraq is no longer as it was, let's say, five to ten years ago. It peaked over the last decade during the campaign against uh, the Islamic State, but since then has kind of um, evaporated to a sense. And this is also something that they that they have um, exploited. And uh, while I agree completely with, with all the sentiments that Michael expressed, um, we see that some of the first individuals who congratulated the new government, these statements came from the United States Embassy in Baghdad and the ambassador herself. She was very quick and very keen on making sure that this government was legitimate, perhaps even faster than the Iraqi people themselves. And that also says a lot about where, where the West stands uh, particularly the United States, which has long allegedly been the biggest influence on Iraqi politics. And we see that that's not really the case anymore. Uh, it kind of even confused the Iraqi people as why America was so keen uh, simply to to acknowledge this government. Um, I feel that that when you look at the larger picture, it seems that the West is operating from a perspective as is 
that as long as ISIS does not control one third of the country and is not engaging in genocide, whoever is ruling in Baghdad is at least a better option. It's almost it's it's very uh, it's a very sum zero way of looking at things, and it's quite dark to be honest because it's never it's never this black and white. It's always Iraq has always been sort of gray. And uh, sadly, that this this interest in Iraq has allowed for these players to dominate not only the political scene, not only the security scene, but the economic and the social scene as well. And uh, Michael, I believe, elaborated and and, and illustrated that that picture uh, perfectly. What's next for this government is this challenge um, of of Mohammed Shia Sudani. Now he's uh, in addition to all the traits that Michael mentioned of him in genuine genuinely being a being a good guy. We haven't heard any sectarian like inflammatory language from him as we have heard from some you know previous uh, prime ministers um no significant uh, corruption charges against him and not even at a rumor level so that's also a good sign but the thing is is the question is um how he got to power and who's backing him and is he really the one in control um when you look at the at the the, the means in which he obtained and who was backing him in particular it seems that he appears to be more of just a facade, and it's more that Nur al-Maliki in particular from the coordination framework is the one that is moving um, all the pieces on on, um, on the chessboard, if that's what we want to, just as an analogy, if that's what we want to describe it as. And that is very concerning. The last time Nur al-Maliki was in power and dominated and had this influence, we all know what happened. One third of the country was lost to ISIS, and corruption was, was, corruption was so entrenched that it became nearly impossible just the mere idea of uprooting it from the country is now honestly just a mirage. It's something we talk about, we all know is unachievable. The level of interest and the complex networks of corruption that start at the higher level and they really sink into um, every single aspect of, of Iraq. Uh, that all was created and all, all that all happened when he was in power. And now he's back, appears to be back with a vengeance. The difference this time is there is some, we can call it some kind of, there is crack in, in Shia unity. It's not as it was, not strong as it was in 2010, but still um, the ones who own the Katyosha missiles, the ones who own the rockets, the, one who own, the ones who own the silencers the, the, and, and have engaged in assassinations, they are in power. And there seems to be some sort of fatalism. At least there has been up until now within the youth. Um, they're too tired of protesting as they see 700 young people died and very little changed. In fact, things kind of regressed and even when the majority of them decided to boycott and even the ones who did not and attempted to enter the political process were quickly sidelined. They don't, uh, they realize that they're, that they cannot achieve a level of influence um, with the way the Iraqi government, the way the political process from parliament to government formation, the way it's done in Iraq makes it very, very hard for newcomers to have this kind of influence. So, for for the people, for the people, for the young people in particular, the new generation, a lot of them are just kind of waiting their time, hoping that things will change. Um, they do, to some to some extent, um, understand that overthrowing or protesting might not really result in change. Um, but the legitimacy of this government is is in serious serious question, and this is probably the first challenge that the new prime minister himself and the new government will face. Um, as Michael noted, that. The, the ministries themselves, they have been distributed in ways that we have become, that have become very familiar in Iraq, but amongst them, the winners and some of the most incompetent ministers that we have ever had. If the past governments have been incompetent, I think this government really takes the, really takes the cake when it comes to <laughs> incompetency and they're all accused of not only corruption, but also political violence. And that is a huge negative pre precedent um, when it comes to the new Iraq post-2003. It's something that we was common in Iraq in the 80s and the 90s, but not it's supposed to not be the common uh, the common theme in, in post-2003 under democracy. So the first the first challenge is how does this prime minister, who overall has approval um, or does not, there, there are not many reservations against him from whether the West are also on a domestic level, but how does he manage to balance between this and between Nuri Maliki and the coordination framework's ambition in the country, which is completely taking over um, all the important facilities, uh, the decision-making in Iraq, kind of moving Iraq completely or enveloping Iraq into the, the, the resistance um, access of the region. 
uh, where Iran is definitely the decision maker or has enough influence uh, to decide the outcomes. Um, that's the first challenge that he that he faces, and uh, it takes it would take an absolute political genius to overcome these um, overcome these obstacles. So we will see him perhaps uh, adopt some kind of pragmatism, but it's yet to see how good he is at it. Uh, the second challenge, um, and this relates sort of to the certain uh, new circumstances in the region. We see, we all, we all have heard by now about the um, alarming protests in Iran. They're, they, they don't appear to be um, subsiding. They appear to be growing. Um, not to say that this will collapse the regime, but usually, um, as also Michael alluded to, one thing that Iran does when it's faced with domestic challenges is that it sort of outsources its trouble to the outside. So it's regional rivals, and it usually uses Iraq as a vessel. So how is this government going to challenge that? Um, even with Mustafa Kalami, the former prime minister, who was at least verbally very much against it and had objected to this, um, was not really capable to tame this down. Attacks continued on, on US interests, Western interests, and even on the Gulf region. We saw many drone attacks were actually launched from Iraq towards in the heart of Saudi Arabia, and even rumored to be even um, towards the Emirates. And Michael can talk about this uh, in, in much detail. Um, how will, how will, so how will a government that's basically formed by these very militias, or, or at least um, supported by these very groups, how will it tackle this when it happens? We already read today about the threats towards Saudi Arabia. We have seen the past months during the government formation, the consistent attacks against Kurdistan and with and accompanied with a justification that um, pro-Israel or Mossad headquarters were in this part of the region, which is basically a green light to continue these attacks. How is this government going to um, going to confront this? How will how will it deal with this? These are the two um, these are the two main threats when it comes to sort of the domestic and regional and, and regional uh, issues that are very dominant in the country. Um, and and when it comes to when it comes to corruption, Michael also spoke about this, but. Uh, we we see some we see, we've seen over the past few weeks um, accusations of corruptions that are being you know uh, that target certain individuals, and there is sort of a sentiment that a lot of it is on sectarian lines. A lot of it is a witch hunt. Um, we find that people that are affiliated with some of the bigger bigger names, uh, let's say with uh, with the state of law, that is the Nuri Maliki's political um, political block, and also with Asab Haq the the other members of the coordination, they're not really included in any of these investigations and in any of these accusations. Uh, that also tells us that these, this political power and this influence will be used 100% to channel um, any kind of perceived threats on this side, on from the from this current government. It looks, it does feel like kind of a takeover that was that happened because their opponent, who was the winner, was too weak, probably did not have the best advisors around him, and also. Aslader is known to be a very stubborn person who doesn't listen and does play on emotions. And they succeeded in triggering him in the correct ways. Um, however, his silence the pa over the past few weeks since the formation of the government is something that um, should not be overlooked. It's very hard to predict what his next move will be. That's the one, one most common consistent feature of the Sadr and the Sadr himself is that he's unpredictable. It's hard to predict his next move. Uh, he does uh, sort of rebel and he withdraws. It's, it, is he still licking his wounds at this point? And is he preparing to make some kind of a comeback um, using what he sees as illegitimacy and using also what he does best, which is the street power, the protest? Um, or has he tried that already and saw that it doesn't really take him anywhere? It hasn't really gotten the results that he uh, that he desires. This is, But however, this is something that we should look at. And, and perhaps focus on what is Muqtada Sadr's next move and how will Hamashaya Sudani uh, counter it as well. Um, and uh, perhaps also something that uh, that should be also uh, into focus, the emerging politicians, the new the new parties that attempted at least or are forming them are forming now. It's important to see also how their formations are coming about. There's a no, huge number of, of young politicians, but if we trace them back, they're still part of this larger, um, the, the larger establishment. Um, and it's sort of a way, this new approach um, that these winning parties, particularly the coordination framework, sort of a new strategy they have in creating these smaller, 
uh, these smaller groups that have some kind of signaling or messaging that is very different to their core message. So on the outside, they do appear to be more liberal. They do appear to be more engaging uh, with the West, with the international system. Um, however, they're connected directly to the core parties from Asad al-Haq to the other militias. Qais al-Khazari has been very active on this front. Um, and it can go two ways. Either these groups can be influential enough to the point that they, um, and also depending on the regional circumstances, whether Iran also will kind of tone down its its uh, its policy, that that's highly, highly unlikely. Uh, these groups can either influence the, the larger groups or they can be, they, they can be even further, uh, more vessels to kind of control any kind of opposition that could be formed to their strategy. Uh, that's that's the summary of the situation. It doesn't it doesn't really uh, look very good, um, and it feels that the this in, this interest in the country has kind of led the foreign foreign policy community to sort of look at Iraq in some sense of fatalism. Is it is what it is. Uh, there's very little that they can do to change things. And these groups and the current government that are not I don't think we can even call them groups anymore. They're officially the government now. They've exploited this very very well. Thank you. Thank you very much, Prasha, and uh, thank you, Michael. I think that was a pretty comprehensive account of the issues that we would like to cover in the, in the moderated discussion part as well. But uh, <clears throat> Michael, you mentioned that perhaps if we take a more optimistic look on the government staying in power potentially for years to come, uh, I think what rarely gets featured in the news, uh, you know, beside the, the hard power issues and real politique, is what the actual policy challenges of the government are. Uh, Russia, I think, I remember you mentioned that uh, you might even think that that actual bread and butter policy issues, domestically speaking, for the Iraqi people might get pushed down further the agenda because of the way Iraq fits into regional geopolitics. And uh, obviously we cannot ignore what's happening in Iran right now. Iran's influence uh, on Shia circles within the country, we cannot ignore uh, Russia's war with Ukraine and how that filters down to the, to the people's level in Iraq, whether it's uh, about the, the prices of basic foodstuffs or electricity or water. So uh, I think it would be helpful, perhaps we could do a quick summary of what are the policy issues that are the most urgent for Iraq Iraqis right now, even you know while uh, political circles and news coverage has been focusing on, uh, you know, the political stalemate. There are actual policies issues that need to be resolved. Um, or if if you think that uh, it will be the other way around, that uh, domestic policy issues will not come to the foreground and uh, the government has to deal with, uh, you know, foreign influence and, and the regional geopolitical context. I can I can answer a little bit on the concerns of, of the Iraqi people. It's the same concerns globally, um, economic stability, um, security and these issues, um, the failing infrastructure of the country. It's absolutely sad seeing that the, the, the environment, the drying rivers in the south, uh, where the Euphrates and the Tigris no longer appear to be even present. All these issues are it, it's directly impacting the livelihoods of millions of Iraqis. And there seems to be very, very little, little effort to, uh, to confront any of these. Now, if you're talking about some positive messaging, uh, there has been some statements recently from the newly appointed um, ministers about focusing on environment issues. That's kind of a new, that hadn't happened uh, in, in previous governments. Maybe also they're responding to public pressure by just simply sweet talk. We might not see any action. That's kind of also become the norm in the country. But these are the basic interests. The, the issue is that how, when there's so much corruption in the country, it's, it's, a very, it's highly unlikely that these basic needs are going to be met. There's only so little that... Uh, Iraq's annual budget can can actually manage, um, with especially with public employment definitely overburdening, um, and overburdening the budget every single every single year. And most of these appointments coming in are based on patronage, based on um, favoritism uh, relations and with with members of the government. A lot of them are also ghost employment, so it's basically just millions and millions of dollars being paid to employees that don't work or don't even exist. When when this is the when this becomes the norm and it has been the norm for the past decade or so, very little room uh, to to solve all the other problems that do require a lot of money. They definitely slip down the priorities, and the government does not does not perform. And this is where we see protests starting. This is where we see people objecting, and this is where we see a lot of anger. However, whenever there is whenever an election approaches, um, we see that the rise in in sectarian narrative. We see that we see security threats. We see accusations of neighboring countries 
particularly Saudi Arabia, Emirates. Um, we saw also, of course, the United States um, influencing certain things, causing issues. We see this rhetoric on the rise. And the, the voting patterns don't really seem to be shifting, at least not enough, um, over the past nearly 20 years, 18 years of elections, um, as much as they should be. Uh, by this time, 18 years after seeing that the, the, the quota system has failed, uh, voting according to sect and not com competency has failed the country, there should be a, a, a shifting pattern, but that's not how, it has definitely changed, but not, it hasn't changed enough. And unlike, unlike the West, um, our politicians or candidates, when they start their electoral campaign, very little talk, talk about um, their programs. So many of them don't have programs for uh, countering, let's say, corruption or how they're going to better service the environment or how they will, um, you know, sort of uh, refurnish, let's call it, Iraq's failing infrastructure. Um, it feels like Iraq has been stuck, stuck in the 80s and not really ever developed. Uh, just walking several streets in Baghdad or in the south, uh, that's very plain to see. They don't address this in these campaigns. Um, they, they, they basically, a lot of it is simply sectarian rhetoric, and that seems to also be productive in gaining, in, in gaining votes. Uh, nonetheless, when it comes to a Western lens, the only measure seems to be that as long as Iraq is not falling apart, it's still united, it's not collapsing fully, um, there isn't ISIS sweeping into the country, that seems to be the low bar that is set that Iraq is still intact, and that's all people really need to care about. As long as there's not a caliph um, preaching from a mosque in Mosul, Iraq seems to be okay. That's sort of the Western lens, or at least that's the perspective that I've seen. Um, and whatever influence and, and aid that these pay, that the West can give to Iraq is kind of limited within humanitarian organizations, startup projects and whatnot, um, basically small polishing issues um, that that um, that express their concern and interest still in the country, but nothing of substance really. Michael, do you have any comments on this section and Russia's thoughts? Yeah. So you know, bread and butter issues for Iraqis are not necessarily the highest priorities for a government like this. I mean, the reality is that there are two manifestos for this kind of government. There's the written and there's the unwritten. The written manifestos say some of the right things, but even the written manifestos, you know, tend to give you a hint that, for instance, you know, they think a very, very important issue is to dis discuss the presence of US and coalition forces in the country. So, you know, drought, <laughs> ecological collapse, uh, the end of the oil era, mass unemployment, militias, lack of rule of law, all these things, drug epidemic, all these things that are happening to Iraq, which you know, probably the, the first and most urgent thing we need to talk about is those 2,500 Americans and Europeans who are sitting behind four layers of security that we never see and don't really do anything. This tells you where their mind is. It's not where any government's mind should be. It's on a quite parochial set of issues uh, that they care about. Then there's, you know, the real agenda of a government like this. Honestly, from having worked on Iraq my whole career and knowing more about the place than I ever wanted to and know more than I want to know now, I'd rather know less, is that, you know, they are all looking at key pieces of infrastructure, roles, ministries, piles of money, pots of money. And they are saying, we've been wanting to get at that for a couple of years. We had it for a few years, then we lost it. Now we can get back into it. That's how the elite thinks in Iraq. They're basically saying, they're looking at the car and they're saying, they're thinking about how they can scrap it and break it up for pieces and sell those pieces and stick those pieces on their own car. There's a couple of good technocrats in this government and in any Iraqi government and I hate to tar them with the same brush. Um, but, you know, realistically, you know, this government might try and do some things about water. The Turkey might try and do, and Iran might try and do some things about electricity with 
grid sharing set up by the previous government, you know, it'll it'll basically find it'll it'll realize, oh, we just did this amazing grid sharing deal with Jordan and the uh, Gulf states. And no one will remember that it was the previous government that actually did that with the Americans pushing it. Um, you know, they'll 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 coattail, they'll fly on the coattails of, of, of previous governments in that regard. Mostly though, they'll purge and they will blame the scapegoat. And they'll try and gain access to the dollar reserves at the CBI, to the ports, the airports, to the oil bunkering facilities. They'll try and expand the government payroll uh, with their supporters through the ministries, through the popular mobilization forces. Um, they might do some emergency infrastructure redevelopment. I mean, you know, with the coalition holding the hand at every stage of the way and doing everything for Iraq, Mosul Dam didn't collapse and kill you know, 100,000 people. If it was left to Iraqi politicians and militia leaders, it would have. Now we're at the stage where Iraq's oil export infrastructure in the south is creaking hard. There's no coalition to do it for them this time. So, you know, will they do the minimum to keep Iraq's jugular vein closed. Or they just hope that the band-aids will hold the jugular vein together instead of, you know, most of the income of Iraq at some point uh, being lost. The, there's a good health minister in. I'll give this government high grades on that. Um, he's a great guy and he could have been a great prime minister. And I hope one day he, he maybe does try as a prime minister. Let's see what he can achieve. The oil minister, even though he'll be heavily set upon by militias, is a technocrat with significant backing, including knowledge of the gas sector, where gas capture, you know, is absolutely vital. Where again, the West and the Academy government have set up the open goal for these guys. All you need to do is tap the ball with your foot and it goes across the line and you score a big goal and you can claim credit for it let's see if they manage to completely miss the goal and shoot the ball in the opposite direction because they want to buy more iranian gas or electricity we'll see um real estate in baghdad is starting to really pick up involving you know map you know big emirati firms that want to come in or saudi firms let's see if the iraqi government can keep those people engaged or if um they basically ruin it by being too greedy and too xenophobic. Uh, likewise, the foul port expansion down in Basra. Let's see if this Iraqi government rips apart the deal created with the South Koreans, which the militias didn't tend to like because they wanted Chinese vendors involved. Let's see if that South Korean deal survives uh, or not. Over. Thank you very much. Um, on the flip side of things, Certain analysts are not that optimistic, obviously, about you know the longevity of of the current government. And um, just a few months ago, we saw uh, what force uh, Muqtada al Sadr and his supporters could command on the scene of Iraqi politics. And he seems to be gone for the time being, at least uh, uh, that that appears to be the case. Uh, and uh, Michael, in your opening remarks, you uh, uh, talked about uh, the legitimacy deficit of the current government. Do either of you see uh, a potentially a potential new wave of, of, of Sadrist uh, uh, protests coming back to uh, Baghdad or other uh, major cities in Iraq. Uh, how will how will that play out over the coming months, in your opinion? Uh, I believe that the, the Sadrist movement have made um, it's an undocumented, basically, and just like a verbal um, time frame for the government to at, the current government to at least carry out some of its promises and uh, showcase what it can do to how it can perform positively for for Iraq. And uh, I believe it's six months is what they've said. That will be the that will that's for them the time frame um, or else there will be protest. Again, this hasn't really been confirmed. I can't find a written statement or any kind of statement on this, uh, but that seems to be the talk, at least in, in Baghdad. Um, I believe at some point the Sadrists will definitely take back to the streets. That's just that's what's something that they've done. It's just it hasn't really led to anything uh, useful. Let's say uh, they they attempted this when they stormed the parliament, and uh, several different attempts over the past uh, few months. And as you mentioned earlier, one of them led to 
significant violence against different groups where even um, the Marja'iyah and the Grand Ayatollah Allah Ali Sistani had to intervene to stop it. Uh, but again, it didn't really achieve any significant goals. And there seems to be some sort of fatalism among the youth to protest as there's this idea that is it really worth going out there and now protesting against a government that is now backed by, openly backed and formed by the same militias that carried out assassinations. They're going to crack down on these protesters. There's nothing that's going to stop them. Um, as they saw the Tashreen movement sort of die slowly without anyone responsible for the carnage being um, held you know, accountable um, or go to prison or anything similar. Uh, so there will be protests. It's just that they don't see them really having any significant role in changing things. Uh, but again, sometimes you know, it's, it's impossible to rule everything out 100%. Uh, protests can happen. And given that protests are happening in the neighboring country that is most influential and that backs this government 100%, that's also something that um, it's interesting to see how this will play out on Iraq streets. Now, there's a question about the, um, I believe, about how Iraqis view this generation, the younger generation of Iranians. I, I believe that the Iraqi people in general never had a problem with the Iranian population. Uh, to the to the exact opposite, in fact, they do see themselves. They do see so much in common with them culturally. Um, they live in similar circumstances to a huge extent. There's a lot of sympathy. Uh, these protests, however, given that they're focused a lot of it, a lot of it is focused on women right, women's rights, and not particularly overthrowing the government. At least that's the messaging that they're getting in Baghdad. It's kind of different. The message that we're receiving in the West is a little different. Um, it, it's it's there's there's not the there's not the same solidarity that we would see if perhaps there were openly or at least. Uh, there was potential to overthrow uh, the government um, in Iran. As is, if there are studies showing this, uh, as Michael mentioned also earlier, a lot of the research centers and think tanks also sadly are dominated by a very certain trajectory and an objective study on this question uh, would be very, very hard uh, to come across. Um, but um, variables in how Iraqis in general view Iran, I think there's two separate ways. There are There is the IRGC that is viewed overall negatively and, and despite the stereotype, particularly in Baghdad and in the South, where the heart of, of, of Iraqi Shias are, they don't view the IRGC very favorably. The, 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 the very few that do, sadly, are the ones who have most of the influence. Um, the more you go to the North, it takes kind of a sectarian tone. Um, that was exaggerated, of course, because of the, the, of the situation in both countries. Uh, that at least to be an assessment from very superficial research and, and not in-depth. I, I hope that does answer um, the attendees' question. Definitely, and thank you so much for addressing both questions at the same time. I'm weaving the second part into uh, my original one. Uh, Michael, do you have any thoughts on what Russia just said? Yeah, I mean, going back to your original um, comment about, you know, that there's optimism that the government could last for a while. Um, to me, that's pessimism. You know, if this government lasts till 2025, that's very bad. If this government collapsed in three months' time, that would be very good. <laughs> so, you know, for me, government collapse in Iraq would be a cause of optimism, uh, you know, if followed by, um, by elections. Um, I don't see the perversion of the democratic process in Iraq lasting multiple years as an optimistic outcome. It is viewed that way, I think, by many diplomats, because they say, can we just have some calm, please? You know, I, uh, I need to do whatever diplomats do. And, uh, and you know, and, and that's not, that's great for keeping the place calm, but, you know, underneath the calm, the place is going to be dying inside. And I think someone like Sudan is, is very capable of keeping a calm visage uh, on Iraq. And I think that more than was the case in 2018, 19, the West is more willing to accept that kind of placebo or, you know, um, uh, kind of, um, uh, you know, a kind of antidepressant. Like they're, they're just, they're willing to be lulled. So this is a very dangerous moment. Um, on the Satirist movement, you know, when was the last time you saw the Sadrist movement act decisively on the street and achieve results? I'll tell you when it was. It was late January 2020 when they burned down all the Tishrini's camps. 
that's the only effective tough street action they've done for a long time and it was against their friends the only other people who were pushing in the same direction as them tactically for a while and why did it happen because their leaders made fun of Moctada on television you know this tells us what we're dealing with here which is you know the Sadrists you can't count on them for military performance Moctada can't count on them either you can only count on them for action within certain provinces and action against static positions like enemy offices, which they can burn down. And the enemy has learned, you just walk away from that office and you come back the next day with your brooms and you sweep it out, you pull your stuff back in. And they've learned how to dodge the blows of the Saddarist movement. So for me, one of the key, one of the things, you know, in Iraq, we've always had, we're like a cat with nine lives. Stuff's going wrong all the time. But you say, but at least they've got that life left and that life. Let's have a, a, a pro-Western prime minister who has strong backing from the international community. We tried that. Academy didn't work. You know, let's kill Soleimani and Mohandas. Uh, tried that. You know, good effect, but not enough. Didn't actually really move the needle uh, at all. Uh, you know, let, let's have the Sadrists go right to the mat and threaten a revolution. They did it. What happened? Nothing. It was pathetic. So, you know, we've run out of most of the cards up the sleeve, the spare lives of the cat. And now when you look at the situation, you say all the problems are still there, but none of the get out of jail free cards exist anymore. They got played, they didn't work. Over. Thank you very much. Uh, speaking of, you know, sort of, weaving both domestic and international considerations into one question. Uh, one of the issues that people have been monitoring closely in the context of Iraq, one of the defining features of its society and its polity is the relationship between Baghdad and Erbil. And uh, the prime minister um, said recently that improving this relationship between the two cities, between Iraqis and Kurds is, is, is a high priority for him for the coming months, for the coming years. Um, so how do you see the Kurdish issue developing specifically under the premiership of this government? I believe the prime minister himself will have perhaps very little influence on, on how this actually plays about. It will be the parties and the, and, uh, the politicians that brought him to power. They will be the ones deciding. And uh, they have a record of being uh, not only uh, explicitly um, obstacle to uh, Kurdish politicians and Kurdish policies in general, they've also been explicitly anti-Kurdish, just, just plain and simple. Um, and uh, any kind, of, of, uh, any kind of, of progress in this relationship will probably require concessions from, from, uh, from the Kurds. I don't believe we're talking about compromise. I believe that they might have to give up on um, many of the advantages that they have accumulated over the, over the years. Uh, and and this, is, this is one of the few issues that um, monitoring just the public per perception of Kurdistan in Baghdad and in the South. This is one of the few issues that there seems to be some kind of public support. We saw this in 2017 when uh, the Baghdad-based Iraq government, when it takes any kind of action against the Kurdish region, be it military or economically, there seems to be some, some public support. This belief that uh, Kurdistan is basically feeding off Iraq and building its own territory and uh, creating sort of a safe haven that is at least compared to Baghdad and, and South Iraq is was more developed um, and is financially more secure and enjoys a, a better quality of life, let's say better services. There, this, this belief kind of dominates. Uh, it's, it's quite prominent um, in, in Iraq. And uh, with, with this public, also with this public support of their policies towards Kurds over the last, uh, over the last years, we see that um, there's no reason for Baghdad to actually offer any compromises. Uh, what could happen is kind of, we see that the, the, a, a fraction of, of sort of Kurdish unity over the years, it's it's always been the PUK, KDP, uh, rivaling one another in in Kurdistan. But when it comes to Baghdad, they're a unified front in the service of the greater Kurdish region um, in in Iraq. That's beginning sort of to collapse, and it started happening post 2017 after the failed referendum uh, by Masoud Barzani. And we're seeing the sort of the domino effect of that up up until this day. 
So how it's, it's going to play out, it's going to be the parties that are not aligned with Baghdad, basically um, just conceding some of their gains. Uh, that's how I see things. Michael, uh, if you have any more comments, I'm interested in learning what you think about this. Yeah, uh, well, I'll tell you this. Um, you know, something that I, I look at a lot, the Baghdad Erbil side, and I've always believed that, you know, the fundamental fault line in the country is really that. It's, it's you know, Iraq's largest ethnic minority is the Kurds. And, you know, the way the country was built in the beginning, the way the history has evolved since then, that's a schism that where it fixed would help a lot with the development of the country economically and also politically, potentially. You know, the Kurds could be a force for good in Iraq, but also Iraq could be a moderating force for good on how things work inside the Kurdistan region too. So with that as a background, um, look, I remember, you know, what um, we said about how this is almost a point of, one of the rare points of consensus in federal Iraq, between people who have vastly different views on other things, they are somewhat closer on the Kurdistan issue. And I remember when the Tishrinis rejected blood donations from the Barzani Foundation. That to me was like, you know, these people don't even want their blood. And they're the reformists in Iraq. They're the young reformists. So, you know, there is something there. You know, right now, I, I think the, the establishment parties in Iraq have successfully moved the goalposts since the referendum to the point where, you know, they say to the Kurds, do you want to be beaten and starved or do you just want to be starved? And the Kurds say, oh, we've got this great deal. We're just going to be starved now, right? That's where the goalposts have moved to. So for me, when it comes to Baghdad KRG, uh, First, the two things are going to need to happen for Kurdistan to stop getting harassed economically, militarily, all the rest of it. The first is that the PUK and the KDP are going to have to agree on how to share power within the place. And that means probably a, some ceding of power to the PUK. Why? Because as long as the PUK do not agree fundamentally with the Barzanis on how the Kurdistan region is run, they have a backup plan. They go to Baghdad and they say, you know what? Don't stop beating and starving. them. You know, keep going. Because whatever you do to them is going to help us ultimately in our leverage with them. And as long as you don't beat and starve us, we're happy. But, you know, go for it with those guys up in her bill because they're not giving us any respect. So the fact is, you know, until the PUK and the KDP are united again, there is no Kurdish position in Baghdad. There is no strength. There is no leverage. There's nothing. And second, even when the KDP and the PUK get together, I think some of the Baghdad factions, particularly Rambak coordination framework, are going to say, well, there's actually one more thing you need to do to get off the hook. And that's, we want another PUK. We want another Kurdish faction that listens to us, the Rambak elements, a lot. It doesn't matter if you're physically close to the Turkey. Now you're going to listen to us the way the PUK listens to us sometimes. And we're already seeing the beginnings of that. You know, people who have criticized Iran-backed militia politicians and Iran-backed judges like uh, Faik Zaydan have been arrested in the Kurdistan region of Iraq on the basis of zero evidence of any actual crime. And these are not just Iraqi citizens, which would be bad enough. These are US citizens. Now, if the American people can't trust the Kurds to host them without fear of being arrested on a spurious arrest warrant from Baghdad, how can any American go there? How can any American work with or in Kurdistan? You know, so there's going to be pressure on the Kurdistan region to become a different kind of place, more like federal Iraq. And you know, my Kurdish friends would say to me, well, explain to me, Mike, why we're supposed to push back on that. Why are we supposed to throw ourselves on the funeral pyre of US interests when you're not actually a very good friend to us? To which I say, you're right. Uh, 
it's a two-way street. You know, if we expect the Kurdistan region to in any way stay as a different Iraq that's safer and more aligned with Western interests, then we need to give stronger support in that area. And I would say the same for Iraq writ large. You know, we can't just ask for favours and expect them to be fulfilled like we asked MBS to lower the price of oil. I don't blame him for saying no, because you know what? We show no respect and we, not, we don't act as a friend. Once we learn some manners, I think we'll be better positioned to actually interact with our partners in these places and try and keep them alive and keep our interests there alive for a little while longer. But the candle is flickering and it wouldn't take much to snuff it out at the moment. Thank you very much. Uh, it's in the face of these obvious real and pretty grave policy challenges, not just domestically speaking, but also regionally, it's difficult to end on a positive note, but uh, both of you incorporated positive points, I think, uh, about opportunities in the current situation. And Michael, your, your, your last few minutes also included quite a few remarks on that front. So if we look at the situation uh, in Iraqi politics, perhaps removed from the international scene for a while, what opportunities would you see in front of this government? Um, and if we look at international actors, uh, whether a new US policy or a new UK foreign policy um, or other regional uh, uh, partners uh, of Iraq from the West, what opportunities would you say uh, that could take the situation towards, uh, towards an improved uh, domestic uh, and international policy for Iraq? Um. I'll start by saying there's there's very very little uh, uh, space uh, for for optimism or to achieve goals that we can say uh, on the long term will have a, a positive impact on on the country and better serve the people. Um, but one one um, one venue that's important is the is the environment, uh, particularly the drying rivers. Uh, this is something that because it directly impacts hundreds of thousands of lives. This is something where the Iraqi government, if it can sort of restore some level of diplomacy with the countries that are directly um, causing a lot of this, a lot of the suffering, particularly Turkey, to, to a lesser extent Iran, with how they are um, increasingly building dams and sort of cutting off the water supply from Iraq. This will, this will definitely, uh, this will require a lot of diplomacy, a lot of, a lot of efforts. It's something that Iraq has not really had a strong point with. Uh, and this is also kind of where the international community, if it wants to help Iraq in a space that is, let's say to some extent, militia free, does not require uh, security investments, does not require a lot of efforts, but simply pressuring other countries to do the bare minimum. So this country does not run dry completely. That is one venue that it can look uh, into. As for the, for the West in general, and I, I trust that Michael will elaborate on this more, but I feel that as long as the goal is that the goal of the West and its aspirations in Iraq are limited to country and state unity, that the federal state of Iraq does not collapse, that we do not see the rise of ISIS again, that we do not see the country falling apart. Um, as long as there is not, there are not genocide campaigns here and there, those are of course important milestones and important goals, absolutely. But if they are the only goals instead of more, uh, more, more or less of a, a, um, an economic and political independent and stable country where the relations with, with the neighboring states are built on mutual interests and built on respect and not domination, um, and where Iraq does not get tossed into what appears to be more of a Washington, D.C. Uh, tug of war between Iran and Saudi Arabia, uh, as long as Iraq is not in the middle. If those goalposts, if those, they, they do not shift, I don't see... Uh, I don't see that a lot of a lot of space for for the West to add anything to the country, um, apart from, as Michael said, sort of being happy that of the calm face that this government um, will uh, will put on uh, will put on on Iraq. Like for example, you see often comments of, "I just went to Baghdad and there's all these amazing new pop ups and nice burger joints and restaurants," as if those are examples of stability and they don't take into account so many things such as class difference, such as um, uh, those are not, that's just a sign of consumerism that wealthy people can afford. Um, if the average Iraqi is not enjoying, or for example, there are new, new um, improved facilities in Baghdad International Airport. Again, some, some facilities that not the average Iraqi is not really enjoying. 
So as long as we're the West continues to focus on these superficial issues and overall on the unity of the country and that Iraq, there's no ISIS. Is if that is the one, if that's the those are the main goals. Uh, it, it's hard to to expect anything more, really. Yeah, those are extremely low bars, you know, and that's that's what you get the sense of right now is that people are setting the bar right on the floor. They're saying, whatever you do, you know, you're going to get a huge pat on the back, and that is worrying. I mean, for the for the Sudani government, the good news is whatever he does, he can probably surpass expectations because the international community has almost no faith in in the Iraqi state anymore. That's the reality. However, you know, if you want to be optimistic, there's a number of things, as I said, that have been set up in the manner of an open goal to just tap the ball into. One of them is gas capture. The West has not only helped Iraq to think about gas capture, it's not only provided financing for some projects, it's not only brought its providers in, even though they swore they'd never come back to Iraq again. You know, those gas capture projects where Iraq could stop flaring, it could become one of the largest flare reduction successes in the world. And it has massive impact on local electricity, uh, capacity, uh, environmental damage, uh, import substitution. You know, it's an open goal. So let's see if they fail to do that. And then there's the Iraq-Turkey pipeline arbitration coming up. You know, these guys are coming into leadership with basically a huge multi-billion dollar present on their desk, which is an almost guaranteed win in the Iraq-Turkey arbitration in the International Chamber of Commerce in Paris, whereby Turkey will be found to have been in breach of the Iraq-Turkey pipeline agreement and Iraq will get awarded numerous billions of dollars for damages because the Kurds, because the Turks allowed the Kurds to have illegal third-party access to the pipeline. Now, you know, the Iraqi government can, can take that and it can say, you know what, let's do nothing. Let's just stick that box under the table. And at some point, a couple billion dollars will be awarded to us. And we can bank that as an awesome win for the new government. Uh, but they'll probably never get those billions of dollars because Turkey won't pay it. And relations between Iraq and Turkey will worsen. Or they can seize the opportunity to say, OK, Turkey, we'd love to get the award and the, and the, the decision and the financial award. But if you want to settle this before that point with a very generous package that will be good for Iraq, we're all ears. And I will even tell you what we want. We want more water. We want more electricity. We want trade. We want you to rebuild some of our infrastructure with soft loans. We want you to remove your military base from Bashika above Mosul. If you can do those things, this case goes away and you don't get a big embarrassing issue as you're trying to become an energy hub that you really, you basically uh, uh, violated an, a pipeline agreement, which is a big no-no. You know, this again is an open goal. Any government in the world could kick the ball in. Let's see if these guys miss and instead, uh, you know, break their leg while they try and kick the ball. You know, there's grid sharing between the Gulf states and Iraq. Again, set up for these guys, like an open goal. Let's see if they kick the ball the wrong way. Or if they buy electricity far cheaper than they could buy it from Iran, from Saudi Arabia. Let's see if they manage that. Uh, and then finally, you know, you want to be really ambitious. How about this for a, an ambitious plan? Why don't you surprise everyone and show that you're not Nouri al-Maliki's puppet by arresting Nouri al-Maliki? right out of the blue, use all the numerous, masses amount of evidence that exists against him and public feeling against him for losing Mosul, for sending a third of the country to ISIS for a number of years. All these things that should have been done in the summer of 2015 to him, why don't you do them now? And then every single person that says Sudani is a Maliki puppet will say, holy moly. No, he's not. Look what he just did. He did something nobody in the West dared to do. Nobody in Iraq dared to do. He, he bit the hand that fed him, that created him. 
And he got rid of this individual who all Iraqis know has been a curse on the Iraqi state. Thank you very much to both of you. Uh, just to be conscious of uh, everyone's time, I'm sure we could continue this conversation as there are numerous issues uh, that we could keep on uh, talking about. But uh, I want to thank you both for sharing your time and your expertise with us uh, this evening or this afternoon for you um, on the east coast of the US. Uh, and uh, I think you're leaving us with a lot of food for thought uh, for the coming months to, for, for our followers to keep their eyes on. Um, I just wanted to uh, do a quick shout out to the rest of our team. Uh, the Cambridge Middle East and North Africa Forum um, will be hosting a series of uh, panel discussions throughout this year. Make sure to follow um, our social media channels as well as our website uh, for upcoming uh, events. We have a panel discussion coming up on uh, the situation in Syria. Uh, we have a panel discussion discussing uh, obviously what's happening in Iran right now, all of these over the coming uh, two weeks. Uh, we also have a magazine, Manara Magazine, which is a current affairs and foreign policy platform for analysts at all levels of professional life and academia. And I would like to recommend uh, our strategic brief, which is a weekly news update service that goes out on our mailing list. Uh, it's uh, completely free. It summarizes not only the week, uh, the past week's most important events from the entire Middle East and North Africa region, but also contains forward-looking analysis on what our team of uh, regionally based experts uh, uh, think will come next. Um, so I encourage you to sign up to that as well. And otherwise, thank you very much uh, to Dr. Michael Knights and uh, Rachel Akiti for joining us uh, uh, today. And uh, we look forward to uh, following how uh, the current affairs situation develops in Iraq. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Patrick.